thank you uh, to Jan Kovic who keeps us online, I mean, all the time. So thanks for that. As you know, professionalization of doctoral education is in our focus and of course supervision is its core. But despite the fact that we all across Europe have already talked a lot about supervision and many good things happen, it is still a crucial part of doctoral education that asks for further, further nurturing. Uh, within the prime network, supervision is often attracting our attention. We are all aware that practices are still quite diversified, in particular outside the UK. And at the same time, to be a good supervisor is becoming more and more demanding and complex job. Uh, therefore, it is more than welcome for our members, but I guess for the whole audience to hear about the new practice and for innovations that might significantly contribute to the supervision quality. Uh, and hopefully some of experiences could be translated to other academic environments as well. Uh, we're looking forward to hear Stan Taylor, who is undoubtedly an expert who has devoted much of his work to this topic. His collective knowledge and experience make him an authority in the field and Pride was glad to have Stan also uh, as a guest speaker in one of first webinars. Of course, all the other uh, speakers will significantly contribute and their experience is extremely valuable. Uh, and this is how we see it from Pride and I'm sure all our members. We also hope that many of our members will be with us today and they will contribute to questions at the end. We'd like to invite you to follow also our website where you can find more information on coming webinars that Pride is organizing, but you can also learn about our network, or about our regular other activities, or just to share your experience with our members. Uh, allow me also you to use this opportunity and to share with you that on the December 2nd, we will have a webinar on research careers and well-being and mental health. And as you all know, this is one of the hot topics today. So we hope to see you then. I don't want to take much of our time because the time is precious and there are many more important speakers to come after me. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much, Melita, for your very kind introduction. And it is a great pleasure for me to, well, introduce myself firstly. I'm Douglas Halliday. Um, and as you can see on the slide, I'm the current chair of the UK Council for Graduate Education. Um, I have been involved in postgraduate education for probably two decades. You can see my current roles there. I'm a director of the Global Challenge Research um, Doctoral Training Research Centre at Durham. Previous to that, I was Dean of Graduate School. And it's a real pleasure for us today to co-present this webinar with the Pride Network. Um, some of you may know that the relations between UK, CGE and Pride go back quite a long way. Um, Ken, Professor Kenneth Wan is uh, involved with uh, Pride and has been a, a very active member of UK CGE in the past. So we're very pleased that these connections can continue to develop and to evolve. <clears throat> so in the next slide, I just want to say a few brief words by way of introduction to the UK CGE. We are the representative body for postgraduate education in the UK. We currently have about 90% of UK universities are members, and we believe that makes us about the third largest organization of this type globally. So we're very pleased with that achievement. As you can see, we were founded in 1994, and really our mission is to champion and enhance postgraduate education and research uh, through collective leadership, developing postgraduate affairs across the UK in universities and working with research agencies and other funding bodies who support postgraduate education. And we do this by providing learning, professional development opportunities. We have a series of events. We commission research. We share best practice. Uh, we gather information and evidence to support policies to really promote a strong and sustainable uh, postgraduate sector. So if you want to find more, you can see a link to our website. So in today's program, you can see on the next slide line of the session, 
Um, I will just say a few short words about the need for professionalization of doctoral education. Uh, and then Stan, Professor Stan Taylor will deliver the bulk of the session talking about the supervisor recognition framework that we have developed. Um, and then later on, my colleague Ian Covey from the UK CGE will say a little bit more about the operation of the scheme. Uh, and then obviously there will be questions before we close at 2 p.m. So I just wanted to say a few brief comments, which you can see outlined um, on the next slide, in terms of the need for professionalization of supervision. As I'm sure you're all aware, we've seen significant growth and increasing diversity in the doctoral candidate population. Uh, we have seen the move towards greater collaboration, thinking about interdisciplinary PhDs, candidates working across different sectors involving industry, non-government organisations, uh, candidates undertaking global challenge research, collaborating with developing nations. So there is a sort of growth in the complexity of doctoral programmes as well. Um, in the United Kingdom, we have widely adopted supervisory teams where we would have two, three supervisors involved in the supervision of doctoral candidate projects, which of course also means a need for an understanding and a recognition of how supervisors might function together in a team. We also have new models for training and support based on uh, cohort approaches, doctoral training centres, doctoral training partnerships. So there is a, an increasing emphasis on the initial, initial training of candidates all of which has an impact on supervision. And I think above all, we need to recognise and perhaps advocate more to other people the demands and the complexity of doctoral supervision. It is a process where you interact with a candidate over an extended period of time. You're seeking to develop both a personal relationship, a professional relationship. You're helping to seek to develop them as an independent researcher and it involves a complex array of tasks. Uh, and one of the things that this framework does very well, I think, is it sets out the complexity of that process. And I think one of the things that I'm very pleased to see is a recognition of the need for universities to adapt the way they support supervisors to offer more support, more professional development. And ultimately, all of this activity should see an increase in the effectiveness of supervision and positively benefit the doctoral candidate experience. So as you can see from my brief summary there, there are a number of really important reasons why it is very timely for us today to think about doctoral supervision uh, and the demands that that process places on all of us. So it's a real great pleasure for me to introduce um, a colleague I've known for many years, Professor Stan Taylor from Durham University, who has really been the driving force behind this framework. So Stan, I'm going to hand over to you now to give us your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, um, um, Douglas. Um, I've just put a little bit of uh, biography there. I've worked at Durham for um, many years and I'm the author on behalf of the UK Council of the Framework for Good Supervisory Practice. Um, I've got a number of uh, publications in the field of doctoral education. Um, next, next slide. Um, the one you may know is a handbook for doctoral supervisors a couple of years ago with uh, uh, Margaret Cardy and Robin Humphrey. Um, something else I think probably worth looking at in current circumstances is the top one um, with uh, Swapna and BJ Kumar, the guide to online supervision. Um, I'm sorry for an unashamed advertisement, but um, my latest publication uh, comes out on the 11th of December, you can change the slide please. Uh, um, it's a book called The Making of Doctoral Supervisors. It consists of 21 case studies of practice and um, there are nine of them for European countries. There are case studies of Denmark, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Poland, Spain, Sweden and the UK. Now that comes out in December. Anyway, for present purposes, you can go to the next slide. 
um, to look at professionalization, let's start from the traditional perspective, which was historically, doctoral supervision was an adjunct of the research function of academics. I've used this quote many, many times. Uh, Ernest was one of the early writers on graduate education. He summarized the ethos of as being, if one can do research, then one can presumably surprise it. And this uh, was underpinned by a less a fair model in the arts and humanities, students left to get on with it, or in the sciences, a master apprentice model where it's transmitting expertise to novices who are observed and hopefully emulated. But that has been um, changed by uh, a number of developments uh, which I've summarized here following the distinction made by Hammond um, um, et al. into to four clusters. Uh, the formalization of doctoral education, the growth, diversification, welfare of the candidate population, diversification of purposes, and diversification of modes, and st modes of study. And um, on the next slide, I've got a, a summary of these relationships. There are four columns, uh, as you can see there. On the left-hand column, there are the attributes uh, of, uh, of supervision, of these components of supervision. In the second column, you've got the, the Humboldtian doctorate, the doctorate that was established at the University of Berlin back in 1810. You then got what I see as the processes of change, and you then got what I described as the, the modern doctorate. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is just fairly briefly um, go, go through these. So if we start from the, uh, the, the master apprentice laissez-faire relationships um, of old, across Europe, there has been a process of, I've described as commodification of graduate education, whereby graduate students have increasingly been encouraged um, to regard themselves as consumers. And that has raised their expectations uh, quite considerably. That, my personal view is that's a good thing because it happens to address part of the power imbalance between supervisors and students, but their expectations these days are, are higher than it used to be. The second change in the duration of its studies, doctoral studies, the generations took as long as it took. There's been a process um, which Simon Blackman of the University of Cambridge has described as McDonaldization, get them in, get them out and get them through. <clears throat> and it's now imperative, and again, this is across um, uh, most of Europe to be completed within four years or less. That places strains on candidates, but it also places strains on supervisors trying to get them through. The context of supervision historically has been unregulated. It was compared by uh, Chris Park to a secret garden in which the supervisor and the student interacted and nobody bothered very much. But one thing we've seen is the interpolation, interpolation indeed, of uh, large numbers of regulations. It's now actually one of the most regulated activities within the realm of academic practice and that of course changed things for supervisors. Supervision so arrangements, there's been a partial process of a change from the single supervisor of yesteryear to collectivization to supervisory teams. But I think it's worth uh, recording that across Europe as a whole, that's been fairly patchy. There are a lot of um, uh, European countries still with de facto and in many cases even de jure single supervisors. Something that has gone right across Europe um, in the wake of Bologna has been the structuration of doctoral education. We've gone from it being an activity just carried on in universities to one it is now carried on in separate institutions within universities. The, the, the doctoral schools, Germany, the doctoral colleges, uh, doctoral training centers, and so on and so forth. It's now an institutionalized activity. In terms of the candidate population, the numbers historically were relatively few, but particularly between 2000 and 2010, there was a process of massification. Across Europe as a whole, the numbers of doctoral students doubled in that um, 10 year period. They, in many cases, stabilized um, since, but that increase has been much greater than the increase pro rata in the numbers of supervisors. So we're having more students to supervise. A second change, and again, this is pan-European, uh, has been in terms of national composition. 
Uh, we've always had international research students. Uh, one thinks of Erasmus or uh, Marie Karun Slavovska uh, uh, as examples. But in the 21st century, there's been a systematic process of uh, migration from what you might describe as the research poor parts of the world to the research rich parts of the world, one of which is Western Europe. And uh, uh, in, in many cases, our candidate populations are multinational. So for example, in France and the UK, roughly two out of five uh, research students, uh, at least before COVID, um, came from outside. And the figures are a third or so in many other European countries as well. So you now find supervising students um, who come from different backgrounds with different expectations. And it can be complicated because universities are recruiting multinationally. So you can now have two supervisors and a student each from different educational cultures and backgrounds. A third change has been academic and social competition. I've used the word elite there. Uh, traditionally, the, the population of candidates was very much white, uh, male, middle class, elite institutions, non-disabled, um, heterosexual, etc. There's been a, a process of diversification. Uh, like, I think the most known example of that is in terms of gender. If you go back to the start of this century, you find about one in four uh, doctoral candidates, certainly in Western Europe, different than Eastern Europe, uh, one in four um, are female. I think it's true to say now that in nearly all of the major Western European countries, a majority of candidates are, are female. Again, that's not been reflected in the composition yet anyway, the supervisory population. There are some issues there. And then finally, under this heading, historically, candidates were responsible for their own well being. Uh, they were adults. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of evidence come out of studies um, in Belgium, um, France, and the UK within Europe about um, research students experiencing mental health issues, either the lower order ones, depression, anxiety, or the higher order ones, clinical depression, anxiety, psychosis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the answer to the question is how far this reflects diversification, are more students coming through with these issues? How far does it reflect the circumstances of doctoral study itself? Either way, um, the view is very much now that institutions have a responsibility for the mental health and well-being of their students that comes down to supervisors. Modes of study, the jump has been from traditionally full-time on campus to full and part-time. That has probably gone furthest in the UK where about a quarter of research students are part-time, but numbers have been creeping up in that respect elsewhere in Europe as well. Place of study, traditionally on campus, there's been a process of dislocation because of information communications technology it's possible to do it on campus. And of course, at the moment, an awful lot of us don't have any choice. We have to supervise our research students online. That is a different operation to supervising face-to-face. -face. And finally, there have been changes in the scope from a, a single discipline uh, to cross fertilization to tackle major problems in the world. You need multidisciplinary. And, but the problem is many supervisors are brought up in disciplinary silos. They don't even have a common language. It makes things more difficult. The nature of awards has changed as well. Um, you go really from, from 1810 right through until the 1980s. The PhD is, is pretty well paramount uh, across the whole of Europe. But in some European countries, uh, including the UK, the Netherlands, uh, and Belgium, there have been other types of doctors in recent years, professional doctorates uh, as well. Uh, aimed at a different population. Again, different supervision skills needed. Then the final thing is that traditionally, you did a PhD because you wanted to be uh, an academic. Uh, as we now know about, and this is across, across Europe, about one in three of those doing a PhD will still be in higher education uh, three years after graduating. In other words, two out of three of them will be working as researchers in the knowledge economy. And that's changed the nature of the PhD as well, insofar as we're being asked to breed people who can work research not just inside, but also outside academia. Those are the changes. And um, if we now go to the, the next slide, and they've been recognized by supervisors. There's a quote there from Holson Malfoy, which I'll leave you to read.
The problem is, though, that the, this particular change has not necessarily been recognized by institutions. Um, this is a, one of many emails I've had raising this issue about recognition from a supervisor. So recognition has been encouraged in the UK by the UK Council for Graduate Education by doing three things. Um, the firstly, um, the awards for outstanding supervision, uh, the UKCG joined with the Times Higher Education to create these awards for 2016 to 2019. Secondly, it's created a research supervisor network, which offers a range of resources and opportunities for professional development. And then the third thing that it's um, done is the good supervisory practice framework. framework. And what I want to do now is to move on um, to look at that in so the first thing I want to look at it, its development. If we can the initially um, I designed it with something very similar to fellowship of the UK Higher Education Academy in mind, to divide it up into knowledge and understanding, supervisory activities and principles. So the framework originally had 22 attributes. Uh, we took it out to uh, the UK CGE, took it out to 13 private institutions, which were drawn from three of the four countries in the UK and drawn from all the different types of, 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 of mission groups. And you can see the list there. And the, the feedback we got from them of people completing the application, again, looking at the practice against this framework, was it beneficial? 100% uh, on, on the left hand side thought that it was. Um, would it improve their practice in future? 96% uh, thought that it would. So these were relative figures. We then also sent it out to general um, consultation of the sector and got over 100 responses from academics and six institutions. And those responses, how well do you think the criteria reflected to the practice? 92% said very well or well, again, was, was, was very gratifying. But there was a, a caveat here. Participants in the pilot project felt that the 22 attributes made the whole scheme far too complex, too time consuming to benchmark their practice. And those were echoed in the pretext responses to the sector consultation, again, which revealed that fact concern. So the UKCG responded by a significant reduction. Um, what I did was we defined it in terms of 10 domains and folded the core knowledge and professional values into those domains. So we've got a list here of this is a good supervisory practice framework. These are the 10 domains. And uh, what I would like to do uh, in the next few minutes, if I may, is to just run relatively briefly through these domains, what's involved in them, and some of the examples. Um, the first one is recruitment um, and selection, which covers recruitment activities and supporting students from application through to final feedback. And as you can see, there are a number of um, um, typical um, examples there. Uh, the, the, the applications we've had, one of the interesting things has been the number of people who have got their own personal websites and cited as rather the detractors, but the very full information they give to potential candidates. Uh, more true in the United States than, than perhaps uh, so much in Europe, participating in campaigns to recruit candidates from groups that are underrepresented in doctoral education. That, of course, is becoming a, a major issue uh, that groups are being underrepresented and efforts have been made to recruit them. Then assessing whether applicants like to make transitions to independent researchers, asking for evidence of research capability, assessing whether applicants' proposed research projects are realizable, interviewing applicants. Uh, in most parts of the world these days, there's no excuse for not interviewing applicants. I know in some uh, you haven't got the internet and you can't use uh, Skype or Zoom or whatever else it might be. That's normal. And then making a final decision and giving feedback. One of the frustrating things for students can do, they apply, they spend a lot of time filling the application, they get turned down without feedback. So that's important. The second area is uh, relationships with candidates. And as you can see, the diversity threaded into here. So examples, acknowledging the increased diversity of domestic candidate population. Do you look at students as, as, as individuals? Do you look at sort of what sort of people they are, what their backgrounds are, 
what the interests are and to adapt to the situation um, accordingly. Again, with international, um, with international candidates, do you try and understand the background they're coming from? Can you calibrate expectations with them at the start of their studies? Another area is being aware of supervisory styles. In the same way as we have teaching styles, we can have preferred supervisory styles, all of which make assumptions about the needs of students. Um, and we need to align those styles to the, so we need to align our styles to the needs of students, to have a repertoire that, that can cope with different students as individuals, but can also cope with changes over time. And then finally, the last thing is being aware of institutional policies and procedures in the event of breakdown and sources of support, not just for students, which is conventional, but for both parties. So that's the second one, relationship with candidates. The third one, which as I say, applies to a certain, in some areas of Europe, but not all by any means, um, relationships with co-supervisors. So examples here will be clarifying roles with co-supervisors at the start of the candidacy. Does everybody know who does what, when, where, and how? Clarifying expectations of the outcome of the project with co-supervisors and with the candidate. And then regularly reviewing relationship between supervisors and the candidates during the course of the candidacy. The third one. The fourth one is the traditional one of supporting candidates um, research projects. Um, first thing, discussing conceptions and misconceptions of research itself. Uh, one of our colleagues at Durham, Eric Meyer, did some work a few years ago looking at the conceptions of research that were brought by, um, uh, by graduate students and so on. They're often very, very different from the conceptions of research that, that we have. Um, looking at key threshold concepts in research, there's a big literature now looking at the kinds of things that graduate students need to understand to get a grip on um, and before they can actually progress in their studies. There are things like the role of theory, the notion of methodology, the selection of methodologies, um, et cetera, et cetera. Issues of academic in in integrity, IPR and co-publication. Then you have the conventions of advising on choice of topic where appropriate theory, methodology, methods, research proposals and plans, ethical approval, skills development, you, know, you really know, need to know the factor analysis to do what you think you want to do. And then finally, this uh, interesting area of advising on issues arising in the course of the research. Uh, again, the research we have suggests that students think that research is done in the same way um, as it's published. So you start off with a theory, you derive a hypothesis, you think of, uh, of, of a methodology, you come up with a method, you collect the data, and so it goes on. And it seemed very much in a linear process. But of course, we all know it's not simply a linear process at all. It can be a process of two steps forward, one step back, and sometimes several sideways um, as well. That was the fourth area. The fifth one, encouraging candidates to write and giving appropriate um, feedback. In my day, writing up was something you did at the end which meant you had to learn the skills of academic writing. And it also meant that writing did not have a central place in the research process. Well, now, of course, the idea is to get them to write from day one, and writing is seen as integral to the development of the research itself. So it's encouraging to write from the start of their studies, usually research diaries, assisting the development of academic writing skills. Academic writing is, of course, a particular kind of writing a lot of our institutions have uh, units dedicated to supporting students to develop these skills. They can do that, but often it's only the supervisor who has those skills in the disciplinary context and who can assist their development. And then the final thing is giving timely, uh, constructive, and I think above all actionable feedback. A very interesting study done um, at, uh, at Oxford a few years ago um, of research students and their biggest complaint was they couldn't understand the feedback they were getting from their supervisors. So somebody had the bright idea of going back to their supervisors and asking them what they meant. And the answer was in many cases, they didn't seem to be very clear either. So it's important that that feedback is actionable. 
supporting candidates' personal, professional, and career um, development. These are the personal issues, including those relating to well-being and mental health. Um, there's no expectation that supervisors will try and directly support students there. The idea is that you need to be aware of the signs that things are wrong and you need to be able to signpost them to professional support. Um, something generally we're very bad at, being good role models in terms of work-life um, uh, balance. There's a lot of three or four recent studies um, suggesting A, that supervisors are poor role models and B, that they often have too high expectations of their students in that regard. Inducting candidates into disciplinary networks and activities. Important for many of us supporting their development as teachers because many of our graduate students teach on our programs and it's important that we brief them fully as to expectations. Informing them about academic careers, that's informing them as opposed to expecting them to learn um, simply by uh, a, a process of osmosis. Again, the literature suggests that very few of us talk explicitly about academic careers. And then supporting them to prepare for non-academic careers. Often we can't do this directly because we have no experience out ourselves, but we can do things like training needs analysis and we can point them in the direction of the sources that they need to go to. The seventh one is again very much more important in recent years, uh, support, recognizing the need to compete within three to four years and supporting them and so motivating them to progress in their, their, their studies. So there's issues here like so-called mid-thesis crisis where 18 months or so in, they get completely bored with their studies um, and they begin to slacken off or in some cases begin to look elsewhere. How do we support and motivate them to progress? How do we use supervisions to monitor progress? And do we participate in formal progression events? Systems vary. Some systems in Europe, the supervisor doesn't participate. The, the, the formal progression is done elsewhere. Others in Europe, they do participate. So that's the seventh one. The next one, supporting them through completion and final examination. Working with candidates to finalize their submissions. I, I've lost count of the number of candidates um, I've known who thought that putting together the thesis was taking everything they'd done in the previous three years or so, putting a conclusion and an introduction onto it, and that was that. It's the notion of a thesis, the thesis of an argument supported by evidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing worth. Advising them on whether the thesis is likely to pass on the basis of your experience, if you have any, as an examiner, and if you don't have experience, that can be very difficult. You have roles in uh, uh, you may have roles in appointing um, examiners for the, the thesis itself. And uh, well, shall we just say that there are horses for courses in that particular context. Understanding of relevant policies, procedures, um, and outcomes, they, of course, they vary very considerably um, over Europe. The, the purpose of the, the viva varies um, uh, considering whether, whether it's an examination or whether, in fact, it, 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 in practice, it's a celebration. The procedures for appointing examiners vary. The role of supervisors um, varies. In some cases, they are on examination panels. In other cases, they, they, they aren't. Where appropriate, supporting candidates to prepare for um, the viva itself, examination, which is common across the whole of Europe. And then it may be the case that candidates are, are they're working to refer of supporting them after the viva. Next, supporting them to disseminate their research. I love this quote. This is from uh, George Walker's et al. study of the doctorate in America. Out from the doctoral research, are often left, quote, like John Brown, mouldering in their literary graves. We need to make them available. Examples there might be setting expectations of publications at the start, modeling the process of publication, encouraging candidates to publish as they go. Well, I know, of course, in many European countries, you have to have those publications. So it's not a question of encouraging them. It's an integral part of the job and, and can be quite a difficult one um, as well, given the lead times of journals, the requirements for candidates to write in particular ways, etc., etc. And then co-publishing with them, or if they publish, don't publish enough, uh, or pub publish nothing during their, their candidacy, establishing a post-doctoral publications plan. And then the final part 10 
of that um, uh, framework is reflecting on an enhancing uh, practice. I saw um, a figure uh, a couple of days ago of a European survey which suggested that around 9% of supervisors in Europe uh, reflected upon the value of their practice, which is a bit worrying. But using an appropriate mix of methods for evaluating supervision, the methods are self-review, student review, peer review, and then looking at the numbers, numbers through time taken. Undertaking initial and continuing professional development. Um, one of the very interesting things about the study I mentioned at the start was the number of countries now where supervisors are being given opportunities um, for to undertake initial professional development. And huge strides on there, particularly in recent years uh, in France and Germany. Familiarity with the scholarly literature. There is a massive scholarly literature. If you go on the UCD website, you see the 200 page list of uh, the publications there. And then where appropriate contributing to the professional development of, um, of other supervisors. So that's the framework itself. Now, what about the uses of that framework? And uh, there are, I think, four of them. The first is individual self-reflection. And you can see a couple of comments there from people who have used the framework for that purpose. I'll leave you to read that. Um, the second function is professional development. You can use the framework to say, well, these are the areas I feel competent in. These are the ones I don't feel so competent in or they're being used by institutions. There's two examples here, both from the UK. Um, University of York developed being an effective supervisor tutorial, which is available, which I understand is being available to the UK CPE for institutions to customize themselves if they wish to. And then another example, the University of Manchester has used the framework to create a, a research advisor toolkit, again, available freely. The third one is possibly supporting applications for promotion. I only know the UK scene on this, but uh, most UK universities have supervision as one of the criteria for promotion. I know in some cases in Europe, at least one successful supervision is necessary before you can become a full professor. But another use would be supporting applications for promotion. Then the next one is supporting awards for outstanding supervision. These are the awards UK CGE made with the Times Higher, and you can see the, 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 the uh, recipients uh, along with some of the great and good of UK society there. And then the fourth and the final one is using the framework for external recognition, at which point I'm very grateful to hand over to Ian. Well, thanks very much, Stan. Um, I'm just gonna give you a, a, a quick overview of um, completing an application to the UK CGE's Research Supervision Recognition Programme. So should you wish to, uh, oh, well actually before I do that, there's a, I, I'm, I'm Ian, for, for those who, uh, who didn't hear right at the very start, I um, am the Martin University Liaison Officer for the UK Council of Graduate Education. And I've worked with uh, Stan right from the very start of the, uh, both the, the framework and the recognition programme to get it up and running. And now I, uh, I look after that programme as well. Um, so should you want to, then you are able to apply for recognition. The uh, application um, and reflection pack includes a, uh, a Word document for you to fill out, which uh, begins with asking you for a, a brief introduction to your uh, academic and supervisory experience. It then goes on to uh, ask you to provide evidence against each of the 10 criteria uh, that are in the Good Supervisory Practice Framework. Um, each, of the, each of those examples should be from your own supervisory practice rather than uh, citing um, institutional policies. Um, they should also be supported by the literature on research supervision. So again, demonstrating your familiarity with that literature and showing that your practice is based upon that literature. Um, for the 11 sections that there are in total in the application, um, you're aiming for about 5,000 words. So the, the reflection process is a, a fundamental part of 
the recognition program and regardless of whether you wish to apply for recognition or not um, we would strongly encourage you to download the application and reflection pack from the supervision recognition program website um, so you can go through that process of reflecting on your practice against the good supervisory practice framework there may be a particular area that you feel that you, you would um, benefit from um, focusing on more closely um, that uh, that reflection process is supported with a, a, a guide to reflection um, which again is authored by um, Stan Taylor uh, citing the examples of uh, good practice and the examples of literature that you might want to engage with. Now, once you've undertaken a, a complete reflection against all of the criteria in the good supervisory practice framework you may wish to apply for recognition. So in addition to your reflective piece, you're required to uh, collect two personal references, one from a colleague who uh, is uh, close to your practice, has, has um, knowledge of your professional practice, and one from a formal, former doctoral candidate. Uh, once you have that, your two, uh, your two references along with your reflective account, then this can be submitted via the uh, Research Supervision Recognition Program website. Um, there is a, a cost for application um, which covers the UKCG's administrative fees for um, running the, the program, which is um, a very reasonable £75. Um, once you've, um, once they've, they've been submitted, your uh, application will be put into uh, into the next batch that goes to review. Uh, all applications are reviewed by a review panel which consists of uh, two reviewers who are, are close to the uh, the framework, the good supervisory practice framework, but also uh, experience and knowledge of um, good research supervision. Uh, those reviewers um, work independently of each other and then uh, come together to agree on an outcome of your application uh, and this is either uh, recommended for recognition or to be referred back to you for um, corrections um, should you be referred back for corrections then you have a, a six month window in which you can resubmit your application for free um, if you decide that you um, would rather not resubmit your application then uh, then you will be eligible for a refund of your application fee but the most important thing I think of uh, submitting your, your application to the program is you will receive um, very thorough um, constructive feedback on your application. So this will be uh, not just where you, it's felt that your application was, um, uh, was, was good, but also areas where you may be able to improve and, and pointers in the direction of literature that you might want to refer to to make those improvements. And those of you who are successful in your application to the programme will, be, uh, will become recognised research supervisors from the UK Council of Graduate Education. And um, this is something that we're um, delighted to see that uh, increasing numbers of applicants from around the world are now um, are now doing um, you'll have to watch out for uh, email footers I know that this is this may be a little bit needle in the haystack at the moment but um, once you uh, attain recognition you are able to include the logo in your footer there's uh, you, you may come across people with their LinkedIn uh, profiles updated we're, we're growing our cohort of um, recognized research supervisors so that was my little whistle-stop tour of applying for recognition um, and we're moving on to handing it back over to you for any questions. So here's a, an opportunity um, either via the chat or into the, the Q&A function that you'll find on the toolbar of your screen. Um, so let's start up Stan. I, I can see that we have a question here for you uh, in the Q&A panel. I don't know if you can see that as well, but it says, how can one align their supervisory style and candidate needs? Does that mean that the supervisor has to be flexible enough to adjust to the candidate's diversity of needs? 
I, 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 absolutely. Uh, I, I think um, the old days when you civilized in whatever style you felt was appropriate to you um, are long gone. Uh, you've got to be able, you've got to have an understanding if you have a preferred style of what it is about the assumptions you're then making about students and whether those assumptions in any case of any particular student are valid. If they're not valid, then the, the assumption now is that you as a supervisor will adapt your style. The student may have to adapt as well. But the idea is that you have a repertoire of all of the four major types um, and that you're able to use them with different types of students depending upon their needs. Super, super. Um, I, I see there's a, a question in the chat as well, um, which uh, I'll pick up, which is uh, how many uh, doctoral completions do I need before I submit an application for recognition? And the, the strict answer to this is that there is no minimum requirement. We don't have a, you must have at least X number of completions. However, I would say the uh, process has been designed with someone with at least some experience of seeing doctoral candidates through to completion. Two to three would, would um, make it far easier for an applicant to dip into their pool of experience um, for them to cite in their application form. Um, it's far easier to, to reflect on your, your practice when obviously you have a, a deeper pool of experience. So uh, while I would say, again, to reiterate, there is no minimum standard, it is obviously going to be significantly easier for you to cite your own personal practice if you have two to three plus completions under your belt. Uh, does anyone else have any questions that they would like to put to us, either through the Q&A or uh, into the chat box? I'll give you a, a, a few seconds to see if anything else comes in. Um, if not, uh, if you don't have any questions right now, we, uh, I, I certainly, oh, just as I, I was just about to say, uh, I certainly will um, circulate our email addresses um, after this event anyway, so you will be able to contact us via email should you wish to. Um, so here's a question, I think it's a, um, one you can have a stab at, Stan, this is coming through the, uh, the, the chat, which is, how do you deal with the institutional politics among supervisors, especially between the lead supervisor claiming to they know it all? Um. <laughs> The, the important thing is if, if you've got a team supervision that uh, you should start that team supervision by going through a, a, a questionnaire essentially saying who does what, when, where and how. And that should disaggregate the roles of the first supervisor and the roles of any other supervisor. And it should provide a document that can be referred to throughout the course of the supervision if things start going wrong. One, one example, uh, it, it does happen sadly, in fact, is where uh, one supervisor recruits a student, gets a second supervisor, and then effectively shoves the supervisor responsibilities onto that second supervisor. And it can be very difficult, particularly for staff who are new to academia and new to supervision to, to resist that. So what happens is they end up doing all the work, the lead supervisor gets all the glory. If you have a system whereby you can put in place some kind of agreement right at the start as to who's doing what, where, when, where and how, then people have the possibility uh, to say, well, hang on, if you look at our agreement, it wasn't going to work out like this. You were going to do the other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there is then a basis for negotiation. Super. Um I've had a, a, another question coming through the Q&A, Stan, which uh, mm -hmm. I, I think is going to, to be a little bit of a, a piece of string answer from you, but um, what's the recommended number of supervisees, Stan? Um, that, that varies between subjects, institutions, whether they're in research groups, whether they're being supervised individually. Or not. So there is no um, recommended um, number. Um, I can say if, it, if it's of any uh, comfort, that uh, in the UK, the usual maximum for a single supervisor is eight. And that's, it's not standard, but it's pretty well standard across most UK universities. I'm afraid I don't have um, um, those figures for 
uh, other countries in Europe at the moment anyway. Okay, super. So just uh, scanning across uh, the Q&A in the chat, um, uh, that looks as though uh, that's it for questions. As I say, uh, I will circulate um, all of our email addresses afterwards. So if you have any more questions for Stan um, about the Good Supervisory Practice Framework, or if you have uh, any questions um, about the, uh, the recognition program and applying for recognition, um, then um, please do send them through to us. Um, otherwise, uh, I would encourage you to uh, visit supervision.ukcge.ac.uk. Um, this is the, uh, the hub where you are able to access uh, completely free of charge the Good Supervisory Practice Framework. This is given in full online and also includes uh, where available uh, links to all of the literature cited in support of the um, Good Supervisory Practice Framework. But in addition to that, there's a number of excellent resources uh, to support your practice. Um, not least, as Stan mentioned before, the Research Supervisor's Bibliography, uh, currently in its fourth edition, which is a comprehensive um, catalogue of the literature on research supervision curated by Stan. And also uh, the Guide to Online Supervision, which is a, an incredibly timely document as we all find ourselves uh, continuing in the grip of uh, COVID-19. This is authored by, uh, by Stan along with Swapna Kumar and Vijay Kumar and, and is an excellent resource. And we're also the, uh, uh, running an event uh, exploring practice, good practice in online supervision. Uh, more details of this event can be found uh, on the UKCG website if you'd like to come along and, and find out more about online supervision. Otherwise, I think that's, um, uh, that's, a, that's a thank you very much uh, from all of us here. Is there anything else, uh, any final points that, that Stan you would like to make? Just a thank you very, very much indeed for joining us and hope that uh, uh, you found the exercise worthwhile. Absolutely, yes. So uh, thank you to you, Stan. Thank you to Douglas. Thank you, Melita. And thank you, everybody in the Pride Network for hosting us today. It, it really was uh, a great pleasure to be here. And um, thank you for your company. I apologise for the, uh, the slightly forced start at, at, the, uh, at the beginning there, but um, I'm glad we got underway and everything went well. So uh, until the next time, um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.